Municipal Affairs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, it is a rare privilege of a lifetime to rise as a member for Edmonton Southwest and respond to the Lieutenant Governor's speech from the throne. Uh, Madam Speaker, I think that it is in order for me to offer my congratulations uh, to you on election as the Deputy Speaker of this House. I want to start my maiden speech by extending my sincere congratulations to the esteemed members of the House from both sides of the aisle on their successful election campaigns. In the words of one of my heroes, John Paul II, the future starts today, not tomorrow. The Albertans sent us here for a reason. Now we must get to work to deliver the future they deserve. I want to thank all of my constituents who voted for me, and I want, to, uh, I want all of those who did not to know that I am here to represent them equally. I want to thank my fantastic volunteers who gave me so much of their precious time and energy. Volunteers are the unsung heroes of our democratic process, and without them, none of us will be here. And I want to thank my family. I owe everything and more to my beautiful wife, Emmen, and our three beloved children, Adan Naya, 13 years old, Tissom, 11, and Ugonna, 4. My family has sacrificed so much to support my political journey, and for this, I am forever grateful. Madam Speaker, my constituency is beautiful, and it is diverse. It is home to seniors, young families, new Canadians, public servants, professionals, business owners, and entrepreneurs. Edmonton Southwest was first created, the new Edmonton Southwest was first created in 2000 to accommodate for the significant business and residential growth that occurred in Southwest Edmonton. In my community, Madam Speaker, you will find children playing outside and neighbors will feel a sense of community towards one another. We are home to some of Edmonton's most beautiful communities, including Wedgwood, Hoxton, Lessard, Jemison Place, Hamptons, Glastonbury, Granville, Edgemont, Woodburn, Cameron Heights, Keswick, Glen Ryden, Ambleside, Windermere, Langdale, and more. We were first represented in this chamber by Matt Jenneru, who is now serving successfully as a member of parliament for Edmonton Riverbend. Part of Edmonton Southwest was once Edmonton McClung, Another part was Edmonton White Mud, which has been represented by two former premiers, the Honorable Don Getty and the Honorable Dave Hancock. The people of my riding have high expectations for their leadership, and I look forward to serving them well. Edmonton Southwest is home to hundreds of acres of natural beauty along the North Saskatchewan River, the North Saskatchewan River Valley, which our government has sworn to protect through the creation of the Big Island Provincial Park. Over the past year, I have, heard the, I have had the privilege of speaking to tens of thousands of Edmonton Southwest residents. I heard their greatest hopes and their dreams for the future. But amidst this relentless optimism, Madam Speaker, I also heard the very real suffering of people who had fallen victim to the actions of the previous NDP government over the past four years. I heard from young professionals who hadn't worked in months and sometimes even years. I heard from small business owners who had to forgo salaries in order to make payroll. I heard from young families who were struggling with an ever-increasing tax burden. And I heard from, the, from parents who were worried that their children would not be afforded the same opportunities they, they had. Madam Speaker, my constituents were extremely worried about the direction of the former government and they voted in large numbers for change. They were worried about their ideological NDP carbon tax. They couldn't understand why they were being punished for hitting their homes, buying nutritious groceries, taking their kids to hockey practice, and living their normal lives. They were worried about the, scar the skyrocketing debt. They knew, they knew the NDP had us on course for more than $100 billion of debt, and that their children and their children's children would be the ones left holding the bag. They, they were worried about the six credit downgrades that caused investment flight and, and shook investor confidence in our province. 
and they were worried about the NDP's habit of resorting to divisive identity politics whenever questions about their economic record came up. The NDP's ideological policies weren't just further for debate in this chamber. They had real consequences for real people's lives. Under their watch, the unemployment rate skyrocketed, and, 200, 000, and nearly 200,000 of our fellow Albertans found themselves out of work. Others moved out of the province or quit looking altogether. Having completely lost faith in our economy, and countless business shuttered their doors for good, the NDP presided over the decline of a Canada's wealthiest and most prosperous province, the heartbeat of Canada's free enterprise economy, and the place that has created unprecedented opportunity and prosperity for people from all over the world. Albertans don't want a handout, they want a hand up. Throughout our history, whenever we have been challenged, we have ever answered that call. Let's create the conditions Albertans need to succeed, then get out of, the, out of the way. In the words of another of my heroes, President Ronald Reagan, there are no greater limits to growth because there are no limits of human intelligence, imagination, and wonder. Albertans are down, but not, not out. Along with my colleagues, I vow to restore the Alberta advantage for my constituents and for all Albertans. But I will need the help of this assembly to get that job done. We as legislators are embarking on one of the greatest projects in our province's history, fixing the economy of this province, an economy that once made dreams come true, but an economy right now in crisis. Madam Speaker, I myself have been blessed to have lived the Alberta dream, a dream I would not have thought possible at the beginning of my life. My journey to this historic building did not begin last month or even last year. But many years ago, on a remote family farm in southeast Nigeria called the Ebots of Nigeria. I was born just a few years after the devastating Nigeria Civil War, otherwise known as the Biafran War. More than two million people died in that war. Most of them were Ebots. And the precursor to this war was the persecution and slaughter of countless Igbo people. The Igbos are known across Africa as the wandering Jews of the continent due to the remarkable similarities in culture, early religion, enterprise, and worldview. The oral history that has been passed down for thousands of years traces the origin of the Igbos to modern day Israel. While I was born into this rich history, I was also born into extreme poverty. And Madam Speaker, I cannot overemphasize that phrase, extreme poverty. I, I am the seventh of 11 children. Two of my siblings, Tedeish and Tunedu, have passed away. Uh, may, their, may their soul continue to rest in perfect peace. Growing up, Madam Speaker, my brothers and sisters and I lacked access to proper nutrition, medicine, and education. The life expectancy in Nigeria at that time was around 40 years, 40 years, the lowest of all West African countries. My parents were rural farmers. It was not mechanized farming, Madam Speaker, so my brothers, sisters, and I walked the farm with mostly our bare hands. We grew, we grew yams, cassava, palm oil, maize, plantain, and groundnuts, among others. We cultivated, planted, weeded, and harvested the fields with less than ideal equipment, such as holes, knives, and shovels. Madam Speaker, our firm saw our blood, sweat, and tears, but despite our hard work, we could not afford two square meals a day. From most of my teenage years, my mother wore the same wrapper day after day, week after week. Neither my mother nor my father had ever been to school, but they knew education was the key to unlocking a better future for their children. So they worked so hard to ensure we attended primary and secondary school, even though they knew this would likely take us away from the farm. While in primary school, I made myself a promise based on a conversation I had with my dad's oldest sister when I was nine years old. My aunt told me that she had seen I was going to become a lawyer in our native Igbo language. I had no idea what that meant at the time, but she described it to me, Madam Speaker, <coughs> That conversation stuck with me. After secondary school, poverty threatened my dream of going to the university. I decided to take a risk and move to Lagos. 
it was in Lagos that I started what I call petty trading, buying clothes and shoes and selling them to white collar workers on the commercial street in Lagos. I used the money I earned from this to become the first in my family to attend the university in Nigeria, at uh, the University of Lagos. I continued petty trading throughout the university and law school, uh, using the money to pay for my education and eventually that of my younger siblings. Mr. Spe Madam Speaker, it was on the first day of the university that I met the love of my life, Amen. Little did I know then, this chance encounter given to me by the grace of God would change the trajectory of, of the rest of my life. M.M. and I came from two separate backgrounds. However, M.M.'s parents were very educated, unlike mine. Her dad was an engineer and her mom was a lawyer and a registrar at a, at a different university. Despite our differences, M.M. saw in me someone I had yet to see in myself. She believed God had great things planned for me and for us. And despite our very, my poor beginnings, she drove, and she drove me to never rest on my laurels, but to continue dreaming bigger. After practicing law for a couple of years in Nigeria, and after just a week old marriage, M.M. traveled to Canada to pursue her master's degree in law at the University of Alberta. I soon joined M.M. in Edmonton. Prior to M.M.'s admission, we had decided we wanted to live, work, and raise our family in the best place on earth. A place where we heard it was teeming with hope and opportunity. I took a position with the patient food services at the University of Alberta Hospital, making meals and washing dishes for our most vulnerable citizens. This work forever changed my life, awakening in me a desire to help others and to serve. While many looked at this as a step backward, I was very grateful for this opportunity as it allowed me to support my young family while my wife furthered her studies. Following this, I went on to work for Legal Aid Alberta and the public service. After writing my exams for my Canadian law degree equivalency, I was called to the bar, becoming a lawyer in Canada. I continued to give back in, in, in any way I could, volunteering for the Edmonton Community Legal Clinic, the lawyer referral service, my local church, and community organizations. As the MLA for Edmonton Southwest, I now find myself in the best, pos in the best position to help others than I have ever been in, and that's exactly what I intend to do. The next four years, Madam Speaker, will not, will not be about settling scores or imposing any sort of political ideology. In the next four years will be about bringing investment back to Alberta, growing the economy, implementing common sense policies, and getting Albertans back to work. In Nigeria, there's a proverb which says, a single tree cannot make a forest. I always remind myself of this proverb because it reminds me that no matter what I accomplish in life, I accomplished it with the help of others. Standing before you, Madam Speaker, I think about this proverb and everything everybody did for me. My parents, my brothers and sisters, my teachers, my wife, my three amazing children, my MLA colleagues, my friends and volunteers who worked tirelessly for me during the election, and of course, the residents of Edmonton Southwest. I am here, Madam Speaker, not for myself, but for them. I am for them, I will work tirelessly to create the future Alberta deserves. This is what Alberta Dream is all about, using one's success to facilitate the success of others and always conducting oneself with a sense of kindness, passion, and community. These are lessons I am now trying to teach my three children. While they may be growing up in a different world than I did, these ideas are universal for the prescription of a good life. I am so thankful I followed my parents' wisdom all those years ago, and I thank God every day that they are still alive to see what their wisdom has become and how it is still helping others. I believe public service is, is an honorable calling and I'm eager to get to work alongside my new colleagues and our new premier who is one of the greatest servant leaders our country has ever known. In just a few weeks, he has shown Albertans how committed he is to improving their lives. As soon as he was sworn in as, as the premier, he traveled to Ottawa to fight against Justin Trudeau's Bill C-48 the West Coast Tanker Ban and Bill, C and, and Bill C-69, the No More Pipeline Bill. Under Premier's leadership, we have already tabled several pieces of uh, flagship legislation, including the Carbon Tax Repeal Act, which is now law, the Job Creation Tax Cut, the Open for Business Act, and the Municipal Government Property Tax Incentives Amendment Act. I fully endorse our government's Alberta Advantage Immigration Strategy, geared towards attracting new entrepreneurs to our province. 
Our Premier is truly one of the hardest working people I have ever known, and I look forward to working with him, as well as my other talented government colleagues, to pass these bills and get our betters working again. I want to end on a quote from another one of my heroes, 